Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I ask you to give your attention to the reading of this portion of God's Word in Psalm 97. The psalmist shares these thoughts with us. Let all be put to shame who serve carved images, who boast of idols. Worship him, all you other gods. Zion hears and is glad, and the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments, O Lord. For you, O Lord, are most high above all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. Isn't that right? It's as true today as ever before. Let's stand and sing together. Thank you, Brother Dunning. You know, God has identified. 
identified himself to us collectively through his word and individually in each of our lives. We are to build a private and individual relation, personal relationship with him through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But he calls himself different things in different places. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, the ruler of all creation. Whatever the name he would be, uh, he identifies himself to us in the context of that identification leads us to our understanding of him. From the very beginning, he identified himself to his first creation, Adam, his human creation. He said, I am God Almighty. And his first instruction was, walk before me and be blameless. That's still true. All of us, millions and billions of people who are sons of Adam, still can have that relationship with God, to walk before him and be blameless. Let's stand and sing together. But he said he, would, he had his blank page in front of him, 
And he says, what am I going to say new about the 23rd Psalm? That's the downside of the 23rd Psalm. Everybody knows it. And so he started thinking of his 23rd Psalm. God is my shepherd. He leadeth me. Okay, he leadeth me like a shepherd. He leadeth me. Oh, that's a comforting thought. Oh, blessed thought. And you see what was happening. He was beginning to paraphrase the 23rd Psalm. And before he knew it, he had this poem on the page in front of him. Almost word for word without correction. He was kind of surprised. And he said, he handed it to his wife. He said, let's take a look at this. It was kind of surprising to me, you know. And so you, you can tell us, Brother Chuck, when you're preparing for a sermon, I bet you've had moments like that. You're surprised at the, the insight that just comes to you. And you, you immediately say, that's the Holy Spirit. <laughs> that's not my smarts. <laughs> that's the Holy Spirit that gave me that particular insight. And that's what happened here. He, said. he was thinking and meditating on the 23rd Psalm. And boom, this nice little paraphrase came out. Well, a couple of years later, Joseph Gilmore is supplying again at a different church. He came in just like you did today, Brother Chuck. Came in early, started looking around, picked up the bulletin. Okay, he looks at the, you know, in that church they put the numbers of the hymns on the wall. You know, a lot of churches do that. So you don't have to have a printed bulletin. Okay, what's the next hymn? Hymn number nine. And so he looked at the number on the wall. He got the hymn aloud, the pew rack, and he turned to it and said, okay, what are they singing today? He leadeth me over. It was his hymn. Set to music by the noted gospel hymn writer, William Bradbury. He was surprised, shocked. Wouldn't you be? <laughs> he said, I thought I wrote that. <laughs> Wait a minute. I had to get published in a hymnal. Remember, he had handed it to his wife. She read it and said, and sent it into an evangelical magazine who published it. He didn't know that. We read very saw it and said, I can write music for him. He wrote music for it, sent it to a publisher. And that thing got printed in a hymnal and the author wrote the text in the hymnal. But it wouldn't happen today because we're all hung up with copyright laws and right and you should be. <laughs> but isn't that amazing how the Holy Spirit moves? And how he uses something that this fellow just kind of thought insignificant. I'm not even sure he used it in the, in the sermon that day. But that's the lesson for us that indeed, as this text says, he does lead us. You know, if each of us watched, watched ourselves in a movie, I bet we'd find how God has used each of us that way too. Little things we do, little things we say to someone along the way that we don't even give another thought to start as little seeds. That's what this hymn is about. Leading us hand in hand to where we should be. Hymn number 461. Let's sing it.
presented by Lana Lewis and friend Morgan Williams. We appreciate them so much. It's great to be getting back into the routine of having our very talented um, uh, choir members and congregation members to be able to share with us. Morgan, you can use that mic. And now she is on uh, 14. Yes, you may, you may take your math off, mask off and I will evacuate and you can step up and play. Thank you for doing this. Oh, 
thank you, Lana and Morgan, for that wonderful reminder that he'll never leave us nor forsake us. Amen. 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 It is good to be with you this morning. And uh, by the way, that song that you just heard, that's, that's the song that we play on WBTG. And uh, we play it just about every day. I wanted to uh, thank you for having me back. I think it's been since, uh, well, I know it's been since mid-March since I filled the pulpit in Brother Jerry's absence. And I was commenting a moment ago to Beth that the last time I filled in for Brother Jerry was the last Sunday before everything shut down. And so when Brother Jerry invited me to fill in, I thought, well, I'm not sure if I should say yes, because I'm not sure what happened. Uh, but uh, I am glad that the churches are meeting again. Uh, I know all the preachers started to feel like televangelists there for a while or preachers of the electronic church. And I know right now we're broadcasting the Facebook Live, so for those of you who are watching from your living rooms right now, we want to say hello to you and all of you who are here uh, as well. I wanted to thank my mom, Linda, and my brother Stephen for uh, joining us today. Um, my uh, mother's mom, uh, Mary Fondren, uh, passed away about a week and a half ago. And uh, she and uh, her husband, my grandfather, were married in this church building many, many years ago. Um, you know what year it was, Mama? 47. 19, 1947, they were married here. And I'm actually wearing my grandfather's wedding band uh, because it fits me and the one that my wife gave me doesn't anymore. So, uh, but I'm wearing that also just as a reminder of him. He also went home to be with the Lord a few years ago, and they enjoyed 69 years of marriage. I uh, wanted to say a word about your, your pastor and how much I have felt fed over the last few months. Uh, Brother Jerry is a wonderful man of God, a man of character, a man of leadership, a man of uh, just the highest integrity, and I know that you know that. And I can sense the love that there that exists between pastor and people. And this is October, and this is Pastor Appreciation Month. And I want to commend you for having something uh, on the calendar in which you'll be recognizing him and the work that he does among you. I heard a funny story about how a teacher once asked the class, which is more important, the sun or the moon? And one little lad uh, spoke up and said, well, it's the moon. And he said, the reason is because the moon gives light at night when it's dark, and the sun just gives us light in the day when we really don't need it. <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when I read that story, though, it reminded me of how often we take for granted people who adds so much value in our lives. And our pastor is certainly one of those and his wife. So I just want to commend you for the uh, way you're going to show them how much you appreciate them. Well, turn, if you will, your copy of God's Word to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. I'd like to deliver a message this morning entitled The Gospel of Light. And I'm going to try to use this little clicker and uh, hopefully it'll work uh, for us, all right? Uh, the Gospel of Light, and if you will turn to Romans chapter 1, as you're turning there, I just want to ask you this question, and uh, Brother David was asking how I come up with a particular subject, and, and perhaps in this case, the Lord led me to maybe more of a difficult passage than I would normally preach on, uh, but just because it's difficult doesn't mean that it's one that we should avoid. And because I think that it actually addresses a common question that I hear quite often. And that question is, what's the eternal destiny of a person who is born and raised and lives and dies in a place where they never have access to the Bible, where they don't have access to a Christian church, where God's word is proclaimed? And what happens to that person when it's time to face their creator at the judgment? And Paul addresses that in this first chapter of Romans. It's kind of interesting how he introduces the letter in the first 17 verses 
And then he really just jumps in with verse 18 and, and dives deep. Uh, but before I get into the conclusion, uh, or before I actually get into the message, I want to go ahead and tell you what the conclusion is so that you'll already know where I'm going with this. I wholeheartedly base my beliefs on the Word of God. And it's not on intellect, it's not on logic, it's not on reason. And I'm not saying that if you are a Christian, you have to check your brain at the door. And I'm not saying that Christianity is illogical, because it's not. It actually transcends logic. But the fact of the matter is, if our basis of authority is God's Word, we have to believe that Jesus is the only way to the Father. John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except by me. There is one and only one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. And he has the name that is above every name, and it's in his name that every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. And so I'm here to tell you this morning that you, you're you have the prerogative to disagree. Uh, I know there may be some who are watching at home who may be unchurched or maybe they uh, feel like there are many routes to God. And, and I guess it's uh, our prerogative to disagree if we choose. But simply I would ask you this, what is your basis of authority if you choose to disagree? Uh, our basis of authority is the Word of God. And the Word of God tells us that Jesus is the only way to the Father. Uh, I know it's our custom here, and so let us all stand for the reading of God's Word at this time as we look in Romans chapter 1, beginning with verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, and so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the cre creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Let's bow in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray your blessings upon the reading of your word, the hearing of this message, and our going out to make a true difference and be salt and light in this community. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Gospel of Light. This morning, I'd like to present four propositions about the truth regarding the reality of God. And the first proposition that I see here in this text is simply this, that every person has some truth or, or light, you might say. Every person has received some degree of light. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, no, that's not true because not everybody has access to a Bible. Not everyone has access to a Bible-believing church where they can hear preaching. And in fact, I want you to just kind of imagine right now a person who has perhaps lived their entire life without ever hearing a, a clear and in plain gospel presentation about Jesus Christ. They've never had access to a Bible, and then they die and they stand before the Lord, and they want to give an excuse. And so they simply say, I just, I never heard. I never heard like all those people in America did. Well, the fact of the matter is, if the Apostle Paul was a prosecuting attorney, he is simply laying out a, a, a very strong case here with two witnesses, two universal witnesses 
to say to that person, no, you have been told about God. And the first witness is creation. Creation. In other words, it's an outside witness. It's one in which you can simply look around and see it. So think about it. If creation were to if were personified and were to take the stand and say to everybody on the face of the earth, listen, if you had simply looked out your window and paid attention, I was telling you all of your life that there is a higher power, that there is a supreme being, being that there is a prime mover, mover, that there is a first cause, that there is a reason that there is something rather than nothing. Somebody out there is intelligent and created all of this. In fact, look again at verse 20. It says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his power, nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. That means that anyone on earth, regardless of where they may live or what kind of access they may have to the gospel, it doesn't matter their creed, it doesn't matter their tribe, their tongue, regardless of any of that, they can still look up into a starry sky at night and think to themselves, you know, no one that I know, and I certainly could not create that. There has to be a higher power. In fact, this is usually where I begin when I talk to young people, or especially somebody that may identify as either an atheist or an agnostic, I begin here. And you know, agnosticism and, and atheism are on the rise. And, and it's likely that you know of someone now that would identify in that way. Uh, a new poll came out a couple of weeks ago, and it was a very discouraging poll. It was saying, according to the Pew Research Center, that about 25% of Americans now identify as either atheists, agnostics, or followers of no particular religion. So in other words, they just believe that all this is by accident. They would have to, because if they identify that it was a designer behind it all, then they would have to acknowledge that there was a God. And these folks have, have basically said no. I do not believe that. Well, what's really troubling about this poll was that among teenagers, among the next generation, that they identify even more as non-religious. According to the poll, it said 34% qualify as atheist, agnostic, or simply having no faith whatsoever. And among adolescents who do believe, 36% identify as Protestants, of which of that group, only 21% say they are evangelistic or evangelical. So you think about it in these terms here. That means that the person that believes that they are simply here because of an accident, they have adopted a very humanistic view of life. And that's the natural outflow of, of years of education in which Evolution is uh, pushed in which a person has a very nihilistic view of life. I mean, think about it. If, if I'm here as an accident, what's the point of life? What purpose do I have if I'm simply here by accident? There would be no reason for any sort of uh, uh, code of life. It would simply be about having fun. It would simply be about getting the most out of life. It would, it would not have any kind of higher purpose. We teach our kids these things and then we wonder why they're depressed. We wonder why suicide rates are the highest that they've ever been. Why there's so much violence in our streets today. Because people have wholeheartedly embraced humanism, evolution, and this idea that we are simply an accident. That everything happened by chance, including human beings. Folks, I'm here to tell you, you're not an accident. You, have, you bear the very image of God. And there is a God. Amen. And all we have to do is look at the starry skies. All we have to do is look at the intricacies of the human body. I don't know how there could be an atheist, atheistic doctor 
who knows about the human body, knows how it works, and knows how marvelously it's made. I don't know how we can look even through a telescope or a microscope, big or small, and believe that we had anything to do with all of these things. There's so many unanswered questions. And when we don't know the answer to those questions, the one who is on the other side of those questions of why is God. He is the one who created all these things. I, I've been passing by a few. I'm going to go back. And you'll notice there Mount Rushmore. And some of you may have gone to South Dakota and, and visited Mount Rushmore in the past and, and seen this just beautiful sculpture. I mean, you, you have the 600-foot uh, sculptor uh, faces of uh, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and Theodore Roosevelt and Abraham Lincoln. And I don't want you to just imagine someone standing there and gazing up at this at this beautiful uh, at this beautiful rock here, the, uh, this this sculpture, and thinking to themselves, "Wow, what an accident that was!" Can you imagine someone saying that? What what an accident it was! You know, it, this must have been due to erosion. You know, this this might have just happened that uh, it just so happened that just the, the forces of chance uh, just happened to come up with these four faces that that were our American presidents that looked like them. Can you imagine if someone were to say that? Well, actually, if, if, you, if you were to say it, uh, that it was only by accident, somebody would probably say you were a fool. And they would be right. Because the fact of the matter is, intelligent design demands an intelligent designer. Something doesn't come from nothing. And when I look at this, I know that someone spent a lot of time uh, on this project and it only happened through planning and through a lot of hard work but it wasn't by chance so a person would be a fool to say that it was accidental and the Bible in fact does say that the fool says in his heart that there is no God it's the fool that rejects the idea of God so every sunset has God's signature on it every, every flower is God's reality and blossom Every mountain is God's reality piled up. Every river is God's reality in motion. God will eventually say to every person that tries to use the excuse that you never revealed yourself, he will simply say, did you ever look around at creation? I revealed myself every single day. Why didn't you listen? For those that say, I just don't have enough faith to be a Christian, Friend, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. That's a bridge too far. Because I've got my eyes open and I see there must be a God in light of all the evidence that's around us. So first of all, taking the stand would be creation. But then secondly, not only should we look without, look around, but we can also look within. The fact that we have a conscience. That's the inward witness. Paul says there's another testimony, that there's a God, and that's conscience. If you'll look over at Romans chapter 2, if you will, the one chapter over from where we were, Romans chapter 2, verse 14, Paul here is arguing about the reality of God based upon a person's inner witness, the conscience. And you'll notice in verse 14, he actually uses the word law several times. And it might help us if, if in this particular case, to help us understand what he's trying to say, if we just sort of substituted the word Bible there, because I think that would help us to understand it a little bit better, what he's trying to communicate. Because for them, of course, you know, they, they didn't have the New Testament that we do today. So if we substitute that word Bible there, that we have God's revealed word about himself, or you could even substitute the word's ethical standard, but I think it would help us to understand it a little bit better. So begin reading in verse 14. And I'll substitute the word Bible. He says, indeed, when Gentiles who do not have a Bible do by nature things required by the Bible, they are a Bible for themselves, even though they do not have a Bible, since they show that the requirements of the Bible are written where? On their hearts. Their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts now accusing, now even defending them. You see, the conscience is something that each and every person has received, which allows us to know that there is such a thing as right and wrong. 
And it's kind of interesting because, you know, before the Bible was actually written, even before the Ten Commandments were given, men just instinctively, inherently knew that murder was wrong. That didn't mean that they didn't commit the act, but it was they knew that there was something wrong about taking the life of another person. It was inherent to know that there was something wrong about taking the possessions that belonged to someone else or uh, coveting that person's life or any of those things that caused moral outrage. The amazing thing about it was it still resulted in this inner, um, you might say, this, this, this inner reminder that when that person did it, that they were disobeying their creator. They didn't even have to have a Bible. They didn't have to have a law as we have it today. But God still provided them with a conscience that convicted them that they were doing the wrong thing. I, I've given this illustration before, and I think it's, it's, it's one of the best ones I've ever heard, that a conscience is like, a, like an inner triangle. You think about a triangle that's just kind of like in your belly, and it's just sort of you know, rolling around in there. And when you do something wrong, one of the edges kind of jabs you. And immediately you know, I've done something wrong. I've disobeyed. I've displeased my creator. Now, some people say, well, how do people do things that are unconscionable? How do they ever get to that point? Well, the Bible talks about a person who has sinned and sinned and sinned until their conscience no longer convicts them the way it used to. The best example of that would be like if your skin is burned, it, like your conscience is seared. It's almost like when your skin is burned and there's no nerve endings. So at this point, I would almost liken that triangle to more like, like a circle now. And those edges have now been made uh, soft and smooth. And now it no longer has the same effect. When a person willfully disregards the law that God gives each person repeatedly throughout their life, this is the natural result. That's why in verse 20 it says, so that men, though, are without excuse because they began with a conscience that worked. So that's proposition number one. Everybody has some truth, some light. And according to God's word, we have those two universal witnesses. Now, we also see here that light refused actually increases darkness. Let's say someone looks around, they see creation, they realize that they have a sense of right and wrong. But what do they do based on those two witnesses? Instead of embracing the light, they actually reject it. They turn away from the truth that they do have. The scripture actually says here that they suppress the truth. What does it say happens in verse 21? We're back to chapter 1 now. It says, when they turn their backs on the light and go further and further into the darkness, notice verse 21, it says their foolish hearts were darkened. Their foolish hearts were darkened. This is the danger of saying no to the light that we have. Because we can, if we say no and we reject it, then we get further and further and further away. And so what we see here is that with truth, we either use it or we lose it. That's something about spiritual truth that I have certainly seen over and over in my life. If you don't use it, you'll lose it. It's like when it's revealed to you, you better use it then because it's almost like a, a block of ice on a hot summer day. It's not going to be there forever. And so it's going to be gone pretty soon. We must use the truth that God reveals to us Instead of saying, I'm just going to sort of save it for a rainy day and hopefully come back to it. When God gives it to you, you must use it then. And then secondly, a darkened heart, according to the scripture here, it says will produce degenerate habits. What are those habits? Well, it mentions one, image worship. Notice again in verse 23, it says, These people exchange the glory of the immortal God for images or idols, made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. So once a person's heart turns from God, what is the next step? The next step is wickedness. It's evil. And so when Paul is describing the way that manifests itself, he said one of the ways is through idolatry. 
image worship in this case. And you might wonder, how in the world could anyone ever worship a bug or a reptile or a stick or some statue? Because folks, people really have and continue to worship just such things. And the Bible says it's because they have turned from the truth that has been revealed to them about God. And then they went into darkness to the point where their foolish hearts were consumed with darkness. And then something that would seem so wrong to most people now seems right in their hearts. Because their hearts are darkened. Many of you know about the situation in India. How thousands of people are, are starving there. And yet you've got fattened calves that are literally roaming free through the streets. These fat cows literally roaming free through the streets. But they're not eating the cows. And why? It's because they've actually worshipped the cows. They've, they've lifted them up and they think of them as, as somehow holy. Can you imagine looking at these cows all around them and yet not partaking, not touching them because they think that they should be worshipped? Now, we might look at that and say, I can't believe that they would act that way. I can't believe that anyone would ever worship an image or worship a golden statue. But before we start judging others, let's also act, remember that here in America, we bow at our altars as well, altars other than the Lord. For example, the altar of success. For example, the shrine of a career. We worship things like houses and property and possessions. And those examples are worship, a worship of the creature or the created things rather than a creator. And it's just as bad. And so we better be careful but that we don't look at God and our smugness like the Pharisee and say, God, at least I'm not as bad as those folks over in India. At least I'm not as bad as some of the folks in the Bible who resorted to idol worship. Because the Bible says it very clearly that covetousness or greed is idolatry. Have you ever coveted anything? Have you ever had greed in your heart? The Bible actually says if there's anything or anyone in your life more important than God, that's idolatry. And it's something that must be repented of. And that's the first way that it manifests itself is uh, image worship. Secondly, it mentions sexual impurity. He goes on to say, in sexual immorality. And where did that come from? Because people rejected the truth about God. Verse 24, God gave them over in their sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. Just one more way that this darkness this immorality began to manifest itself. A dark heart manifests itself in this type of impurity. That was true certainly in Paul's day as it is today. And sometimes we think that, that it's worse today than it's ever been. But if you look back, I mean, in, in the history books, it was, it was bad then as well. In Paul's day and in his generation, the culture that he preached and ministered to was at least as immoral as ours is today. So he knew something of this, uh, not certainly by necessarily experience, but just in the towns that he would minister in, in the statues that he would see, in the things that he would observe. He knew that this kind of thing existed then as well. And we won't go into a lot of tawdry examples, but just to say simply this, that it was a problem then, and it certainly is a problem in our day and time of darkness. Now, I want to move on to our third point, and that is that light obeyed increases light. Light obeyed increases light. I've already said that when a person receives light and they say no and they move away from it, that increases darkness. But what about the person that gets a little bit of light and now they do accept it and they say, Lord, show me more. I want more. God is going to respond to that person by increasing the light. Let me give you a few examples here. And the scripture gives plenty, but I'll give you a couple of prominent ones. The Ethiopian man. You remember in Acts, the 8th chapter, 
It was an interesting story about a man from Northern Africa. And he was not a believer at the time, but he at least knew that there had to be a God. He knew that there was a creator, and he was interested in learning more. So he had, come, he had gone to Jerusalem, and we're told that he was sitting there uh, in his chariot after having obtained a copy of the scroll of Isaiah, and he was reading it but did not understand the words that he was reading. He didn't understand that prophet that was prophesied in Isaiah 53. Who would be bruised and rejected, the man full of sorrows, the, the, the man who was described who would die in our place, and the description was as if the, the writer was literally sitting under the cross as he wrote it, which shows us the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he was reading this and he didn't understand the words. And I'm sure he had a, a prayer, Lord, show me that I might understand. And in response to that, what did God do? God sent a Christian by the name of Philip to this Ethiopian man. And Philip at the time was preaching in Samaria. An angel woke him up and he followed the, and he told him, he said, I want you to go and tell this man the, the full truth about Jesus because he wants to follow the light. And so Philip goes uh, out to the desert. They have what you might call a divine rendezvous. And this man understands and wants to be baptized. And right there on the spot, he was, he was baptized, received Christ as his Savior. And the interesting thing about that is that years later, when the first so-called missionaries went to that part of northern Africa to preach the gospel, they discovered there were already Christians there. And it was because a man had responded to the light that he had. And God increased his life. God gave him more. So we see that wonderful example of the Ethiopian man in Acts 8. We also see in Acts chapter 10 uh, the example of Cornelius. And you can go on and read this one yourself later today. But there's a man by the name of Cornelius who is a Roman soldier, a centurion. And, and in fact, I can imagine one night, probably when he was on sentry duty, he probably looked up into the star-filled sky and probably realized that he didn't have anything to do with creation. And so that first example of nature screaming, there's a creator, it most likely communicated to him that there was a God and he wasn't him. And then that he realized that he had a conscience, but he knew he needed more. But the interesting thing about this man, Scripture says that he had done a lot. He had already been a man who fasted several times a week, but yet he was not a Christian. He was already a man who prayed regularly, yet he was not a Christian. He was already a man who had given alms. In other words, he did good deeds for the poor, but he was not a Christian. In fact, he was a man who even believed in God. You may have heard this before. I believe in some being out yonder somewhere. But that still wasn't enough. And so one day, perhaps he was praying, Lord, I want to know you more. I want to know you better. It's not enough for me just to know those things and to do those things. He sensed that he needed more light. And so the scripture tells us very clearly that Simon Peter was sent to him. And the interesting thing about this story was that God, in this case, actually had more trouble with the messenger than he did with the message. Because Peter said, I don't want to go. He said, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Jew and he's a Gentile. I can't go in his house. But God had to give him a vision that, that God is no respecter of persons, that the good news is for every person on the planet. And so finally, Peter goes up there and tells Cornelius about Jesus. And of course, the scripture tells us that he and all of his family were saved. Third, we see missionary accounts. These are modern day accounts. And I won't go into a lot here uh, because we're running out of time, but I simply want to say it's amazing to me. If you ever read our Southern Baptist literature, and I hope you do, I hope you subscribe to the Alabama Baptist, and I hope that you pay attention to what is going on in the mission field, because it's amazing that these are not just events that we read about in Scripture, but sometimes in the most remote places of Africa, for example, among tribal people, that, they, that there are miracles that are taking place. And they're praying that God will show them something more than the, than the tribal spirits and the magic arts of their ancestors and the, the shamanism that they had always known. And they're denouncing that because God is sending them 
missionaries. In some cases, what looks like accidents. I've even read of stories of, of plane crashes before with missionaries who were going to completely different places and they showed up and, and, and the tribal people said, we were praying that God, if whatever his name is, would reveal himself to us and here you are. This kind of thing continues to happen every day. And then fourth, anyone, anywhere, who follows the life that they have can find the full truth about God. Regardless of ethnic background, regardless of what they've done, regardless of their language or their history, I truly believe that any person on the face of the earth, whether in the deepest, darkest parts of Africa or the most remote point of a polarized cap, anybody who seeks the truth about God will find the full truth about God. And that full truth is wrapped up in the person of Jesus Christ, God's only Son. So fourth and finally, people will be judged according to the light that they have. People will be judged according to the light that they have. I sometimes question, I sometimes question why God allowed me to be born in America. Have you ever wondered that? How blessed are we to be born in this wonderful country of ours with all the freedoms that we have? But not just that, not just the fact that we have democratic form of government or republic, but also the fact that we have the gospel all around us. We're just saturated with it, with churches on every corner, with Christian radio and Christian television, with so many opportunities to hear and to respond to the gospel. And I think about how some people not only get one or two shots to come to Christ, and we literally have thousands of opportunities to respond to the gospel in our lifetime. And so I think about this, and I think about how there will be degrees of punishment according to Scripture when judgment time comes around. And one of the best examples of this is Matthew chapter 11. We'll put it on the screen here. Jesus is talking about the city of Capernaum, which did most of his ministry there. That was the home base of his ministry for three and a half years. And you'll notice what Jesus said here. He says, and you, Capernaum, will you be lifted up to the skies? He said, no, you will go down to the depths. Because he says, if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. But I tell you that it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. That's what I'm talking about when I mean degrees of punishment. Did you catch this? Jesus is saying, here's this wicked city that we all know of, Sodom, that God destroyed by fire in the Old Testament. And he says, and then you have Capernaum that he spent three and a half years ministering to. And he said it will be more tolerable for Sodom than it will be Capernaum. Because look at all the light that Capernaum had. And yet they still rejected the good news after it had been preached for all those years. So for Sodom to reject God is one thing. But when a city that has that much light rejects the gospel... Well, that's something else. And the Bible says their punishment is going to be terrible. And maybe some of you have visited the Holy Land. And if you've ever visited the ruins of Capernaum, you'll see it isn't a city today. Tiberius up the road, yes, still a thriving city. Nazareth over the hill, still a thriving city. Cana is a thriving city. Why is Capernaum nothing but a bunch of ruins? They had light, more light than anybody else. And yet they still rejected it. So we could ask the question, how will God judge the pagan who never heard the gospel? And plenty of people will ask that. Folks, I think that's the wrong question. Because to be quite honest with you, it's not up to you and it's not up to me how he's going to judge them. It's up to the Lord. And I think there's clear indication in Scripture as we just read that God knows who repents, and God even knows who would have repented had they had the same life that other people did, as with Sodom. The real question we need to be asking is this. How will God judge an America who heard it many times? And that includes America, and to make it specific, a North Alabamian, where we are truly in not only the Bible Belt, but the buckle of the Bible Belt. How's God, God going to deal with people in North Alabama, a land where there's a church on every corner, Bible in every hotel room, Christian resources all around us, 
where it's on the radio, it's on the TV. We've heard it many times. How's he going to deal with this area? How's he going to deal with our household? He's going to judge us according to the light that we have. How are we doing with that? I'll close with a story, and you all heard the story of Helen Keller, born in the 1800s in Tuscumbia. was a beautiful, healthy little girl until the age of 18 months when she contracted a terrible disease and because of an infection that left her totally blind, totally deaf, and for that reason also she could not speak. And thus began her challenge. And at the time when a person was in her situation, when they were deaf and dumb, they had a special place for them. They would just put them in an asylum. Most of them would live out their lives that way. But her parents did not want that to be her future. And so, of course, they hired the 17 year old teacher to come there and instruct her. And Braille at the time had not yet become that widespread. And so they she was taught the little sign language that she could put in the little girl's hands so she could understand it. And we all know the story of the fountain, and we all know the we all know what she grew up to become. But one of the things that I thought was interesting was that when she was a late teenager, that a preacher was brought in by her parents <coughs> because they were both Bible believing people. And when this preacher came in, he explained to her this way with her hands about Jesus and. When he finished, it is said that Helen Keller said these words after smiling brilliantly. She said, oh, I know him. She said, I've known him for many years. I just did not know his name. And when I think about that story, I think about how many people know a partial truth. And they have been praying to the Lord, give me more light. And they respond to the, the light they do have. And in so doing, in so walking toward that, more of their path is illuminated. God has said, I will be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. So respond to the light that he has given you. And he's given you a lot of light. And the fact of the matter is, when he gives you light, he expects you to respond in faith. Will you stand with me at this time? Father, we love you today, and Lord, we know that you have all blessed us immeasurably by allowing us to be born in this wonderful country where we have so many opportunities to hear the gospel. Lord, if there's someone here today who maybe they've been rejecting your truth, whether it's on an intellectual level or even a, a moral reason, Lord, I pray that they would turn from from the darkness and they would turn to the light and trust in your son Jesus Lord if there's a Christian here today who, who may believe but if they're just not living right Lord I pray that today that they would commit themselves afresh to be the kind of person that, that you want them to be and Father may our goal each and every one of us be to Become a witness for you. Lord, I, I know that our job is to hold out the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. And I pray that we'll be willing to go wherever you may send us. Because we know that there are people who are crying right now, show me more of you and show me your light. And Lord, we are to be your hands and your feet. And so I pray that when they ask that, and when they want a missionary to come, that because of the prayers that we've offered and the gifts that we've given, and maybe the calls that we've surrendered to ourselves, that we'll be there, either personally or through a surrogate, to answer those questions and provide them with the light of the gospel. Thank you, Lord, that the heart of the gospel hasn't changed. That Jesus died for our sins, was buried and rose again, and therefore has reconciled us to you through his atoning sacrifice. Lord, that's the message that's going to bring freedom to the oppressed. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Perhaps you're here today and maybe you've never received Christ as your Savior. I want to give you that opportunity. I don't know how many times you've heard the gospel. I don't know how many times you've rejected it. I don't know how many times you'll have left. This may be the last opportunity. The Bible says today is the day of 
of salvation. Let it be your day to turn from your sin and receive Christ as your Savior. Maybe you've been on the sidelines too long and you've been sort of just playing church. And this is the time to make it real, to do business with the Lord. Maybe here at this altar, maybe where you're standing. Whatever God is leading you to do, this is an important time of decision. day that you've blessed us with. We just pray that you'll bless our comings and our goings. Help us to always be mindful of the calling that you have upon our lives, to always be your witnesses. And Lord, that is so important, especially in the day and time that we live in today, where it seems like truth is questioned, the source of truth, and the authority that we, that we appeal to. Lord, I just ask that you help us as we hold out the truth of your word. Lord, it is unchanging. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's your inherent or inerrant, infallible truth. And Lord, just like you, it will never change. And so I pray that we will study it, that we will that we will ruminate on it, that we will always be faithful to it, uh, both as, as as individuals and also this church. Lord, because we know that First Southern has stood upon the timeless, unchanging Word of God since its existence. And because of that, you have blessed this church immeasurably. Lord, we just thank you again. We praise you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.